to Tuesday of week eight. Today we're going to talk about drafting and prototyping, two really important activities for both writing and designing. On Thursday, we're going to go back a bit in time and talk about postmodernism and some of the influences that have shaped design culture and design work over the last hundred years or so. There are no activities and no modules this week. Next week, week nine, we'll jump into module four and continue work with Photoshop. So in this video, I want to follow up on your module three work, our first week with Photoshop, and then I'm going to talk about drafting and prototyping. I really enjoyed spending time with your Module 3 work. If you're still considering an honors option for class, um, you should decide on what you want to do immediately. We're just past midterm, and supersizing Module 3 is an option. Let me know if you want to talk more. The points and grades breakdown are the same as Modules 1 and 2. And again, you can revise any work from class and resubmit it for a higher grade. Your grade can never go down. I wanted to share a few examples, and this was really, really hard, as I wanted to include all of your work in the slideshow. The first activity asked you to do some work with filters. And one aspect of your work I was really impressed by was the photos you chose to work with. Some of the initial photos, whether it was the colors or the angles at which they were shot, were fantastic to begin with. The second activity asked you to do some work colorizing a grayscale image. For the third activity, you created celebrity food landscapes. And again, here, the choice of the original images makes such a big difference. All three are high resolution with really vibrant colors. I wanted to pause on two that I thought were great, but wanted to share the impact a few more tweaks can have. So here's our original and another version. And if we look at these side by side, we can see some of the subtle changes. I mean, well, obviously it's a completely different cow photo. I couldn't find the original, um, but I did find a higher quality, higher resolution one. I zoomed way in and used the eraser tool at a small size to erase as much as the background from the Kobe photo as possible. I erased the background from between his arm and his body. And because there were three layers here, the background cow photo, the food photo, and the Kobe photo, I adjusted the brightness contrast to the Kobe image just a bit. <laughs> Another example. And a revision. And in the revision, you can see the photo is cropped a bit tighter. But I wasn't sure if doing this really messed up the original designer's intent or not. So though it might be aesthetically a bit better, I might have broken the reason why the original designer retained so much of the football field in the original. I made Joe a bit bigger and crop the photo so his missing torso wasn't visible. Like Kobe, I used the eraser tool a bit tighter around Joe. For activity four, the final activity, I asked you to represent your postmodern complex sense of self, and you created some really compelling, interesting work. Will anyone ever ask you again to create a celebrity food landscape? Probably not. Will anyone ever ask you again to visually create a representation of your complex postmodern identity? Nope. <laughs> but will you ever have to think creatively and expansively using found or provided materials? Absolutely. Will you have to draw upon industry standard tools to create visually compelling images? Absolutely. So to sum up, for Module 3, we opened and saved files, edited image sizes, learned a bit about image size and resolution, along with screen and print differences. You deployed filters, did some work with color, merged images, and represented a complex theoretical idea visually. And we'll continue this work with Module 4. I want to toggle now to talk a bit about drafting and about our readings for today. Just like a good paper, report, executive summary, presentation script, etc. isn't created on the first draft, most visual creation, most design work doesn't nail it on the first draft. I recently worked on a logo design project for an academic program and there were about 50 drafts of the logo before the client decided on the final version. 
Our RAC communications director and intern are working right now on a department lookbook. We're early on in the project, but our layout considerations have been revised about 10 times so far, and we'll likely change a lot more before we get to the final production ready lookbook. I would encourage you to embrace revision as a generative, healthy, important part of any writing and any design work. Let's talk about drafting first, and we're going to return to the remix of their traditional rhetorical canons. But first, to refresh ourselves on the key rhetorical considerations, audience, purpose, and context. They should frame any drafting, any project you're working on. Who is it for? What is it supposed to do? Where and how will it be seen or used? And then the canons. A step in your design drafting process should be invention, doing some research, developing a concept. For instance, if a client is asking you to do some logo design work, you should definitely do a broad search of the logos of all the client's competition and the logos of similar related businesses or organizations. That's part of invention. The next step feels most drafting like, and that's arrangement, sketching, laying out. Even if you don't think you're good at drawing, creating some basic layouts with different possible arrangements on paper is a great way to start, and it's a way to start away from the software. Next is style, and a lot of designers try to jump immediately to this step, which I think is a huge mistake. You really have to spend time with your audience, purpose, and context. You have to do some researching and vetting, and you might want to do some initial arrangement sketching before you move into specific stylistic choices. One of the reasons we're going to be reading a lot of before and after magazine articles this second half of class is because they actually show some steps and examples of what this and other design processes look like. I want to talk about creating and delivering memorable documents in tandem. These steps don't always happen together, but for the example I want to share, they do. Week six in our discussion of color theory, I shared an example annual report and pointed out what I thought was a really memorable feature, the use of hand-drawn graphics along with high resolution, high quality photographs. I also mentioned a really innovative delivery technique that the cover of the report had actual seeds embedded in it so you could plant the front cover and grow wildflowers. From drafting, I want to move into talking a bit about prototyping. Drafting often involves working on flat, static documents, although not always. Drafting also isn't necessarily an interactive, user-focused, or user-involved process, or when it is, the user is often the client. Prototyping, however, is a key component of creating interactive materials like app interfaces or website menus. You'll read a few great articles about prototyping for today, and if you're an XA major, you'll do a lot of prototyping in your classes. For today, instead of telling you about prototyping, I want to show you a prototyping activity that Professor Casey McArdle and I led for Grandparents University. To give you a sense of our audience and context, Grandparents University is an MSU event. It's held during the summer, and MSU alums who are grandparents are invited to campus to take classes with their grandkids. We knew we need an activity that would engage kids between, say, 7 or 12 years old, and that would interest the grandparents. Our purpose or goal was to engage the kids in thinking about prototyping from a user experience perspective, and of course, also give them a Spartan experience. So our activity was to have them work in small groups to prototype an ice cream finder app. We talked about what prototyping is and looks like and shared a brief Google video describing how Google uses paper prototyping practices. What is a prototype? The way I think about it, a prototype is an experimental model of an idea. It's a way to give our ideas a presence that we can put in front of somebody else to see if our idea has value. As a design researcher here at Google, I put ideas in front of people who use our products all the time. So don't be afraid to share your prototypes early and often to get feedback to guide your next product design decision. Let's take a look at how teams at Google take an idea in their head and make the first stroke of the pen on paper. I often work in digital prototyping and graphic design tools to create high-fidelity mocks like these. But even at a high-tech company like Google, we generally start the design process with something that looks a lot more like this. 
Sketching is a fundamental part of the design process and can help you make key decisions about what to design. It can be as simple as drawing on a piece of paper or even a post-it note. Or you can use any of these common materials to create a more realistic sketch and share your sketch with others. Sketching can be used in nearly any stage in the product design process. You can use different types of sketches depending on who you're working with and what you need to communicate. Sketching is great when thinking through all of the initial ideas running through your head. You can sketch to outline the steps in a user flow, explore a variety of layouts, and to show the basic app structure, or what we commonly call a wireframe. Once you've agreed on the rough layout, we usually create higher fidelity sketches with details such as buttons, images, and color. At this point, you may decide to transfer your sketches to your digital tools, but the more you can flesh out your ideas on paper, the faster you'll move on your computer. It can be faster to communicate and validate your new ideas through sketches before you have to make those changes to your digital prototype. In addition to sketching, another low fidelity option is paper prototyping. And let me give you some practical paper prototyping pro tips. As you can see with the sketch that Miriam created, it's easy to visualize the user flow, but it's a little bit more difficult to understand the user interactions between the screens. You can use your paper prototype to simulate interactions. For example, if we look over here, I've pre-created some paper prototypes, and we can explore what happens when I click on an individual button. Here we have the floating action button or the quantity, and we can actually have it drop down and see what happens when a new screen appears and we're looking at the checkout cart. We can also select the address and a pop-up window will appear. Then our first step was to have them do some thinking about aspects of the app, including the who, what, where, why, and when of their potential users. After giving them time to work on their worksheets, we discussed as a big group their ideas and then moved into asking them to clarify some details, including questions and considerations. They suggested great things like what if someone's lactose intolerant or gluten-free or they don't have a car? Or what if there were awards and levels built into the app that would get you perks like free ice cream? After a discussion of audience purpose, context considerations, and questions, we provided worksheets and asked them to work in their groups to sketch out the first few interactions users would have with their imagined app. After some time to work, we tested the prototypes by hanging them around the room and invited people to walk through each sequence and post sticky notes. Green stickies were for noting good things. Pink stickies were for confusing things. Yellow stickies were for suggestions. And the next step was to refine the prototypes. We asked each group to gather their stickies and make some revisions and refinements based on the feedback. We then talked about what might come next. We talked about and briefly looked at the coding underneath a couple of example apps and talked about moving into development. We talked about marketing, getting the app out there in the world, promoting it on the Android and Apple stores, getting people using it. In an article about prototyping, Laura Bush suggests the positives of this sort of low fidelity prototyping. You can address major problems early on before development starts. You can build and draft and test cheaply. You can get user feedback that focuses on high level issues rather than really fine grained interface considerations. And Jerry Cow adds to this list, suggesting that low fidelity paper prototyping can help you to generate ideas and revisions quickly. It's cheap, it's fun, it's creative. It can be a great team building exercise. There's very little of a learning curve. Not everyone can certainly jump into and start coding an app, but everyone can sketch ideas. I wanna end with this discussion of prototyping with a great quote from one of our readings from today, from Kim Baer, who warns, don't let your project turn into a Winchester house. She's talking about project scope creep and about adding too many features, too many items, too many options. And early on, good practices of prototyping can help protect against this. And what she's referring to is the Winchester house in California. Sarah Lockwood Party Winchester was the widow of William Winchester, an heiress to the Winchester gun fortune. He died young, as did her only daughter. She moved to California, bought an eight-room farmhouse, and kept adding to it without any architectural plans or purpose. And this building went on for decades. There are windows that open into interior rooms, 
rooms that are open to the outside. There are stairs that don't actually go anywhere. The Winchester House is a brilliant example of why architectural drawings and plans are so important. Prototyping is an excellent practice for focusing your design work, getting some ideas done on paper, and refining based on your users' experiences with your ideas. Our work for today is to read the chapter the Kim Bear Winchester House quote came from. It's a chapter from our book, Information Design Workbook. And we're also going to read a short online piece about prototyping by Lyndon Cerejo. Mm -hmm.